There we go. Yeah, Restream actually wasn't uh, pushing the information forward like it was supposed to. I had to do a reset. So. But we appear to be live, so hello everyone who's watching. Hey everybody, welcome to Reaper Pro Tips with your host, Anne, me, and disembodied voice, Justin. Are, are you our mascot, Justin? Is that what you uh, are? You know, I'll take that. Why not? I'll take that? Yeah. Justin the mascot? All right, we'll rock that. Awesome. Sweet, 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 sweet. Well, hello, as welcome. As I'm a uh, source of hilarity and joy. The shine, the ray of sunshine in our in our dark universe. Is that you, Justin? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's me. Yeah, or something. <laughs> I like the or something. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Miss Tim. Good morning, Edgem, Road Dog, Otter Mama, and Treasurama. Um, up. Oh, Treasurama wants to know where's my blorf. Yeah, where's my blorf? Trash say he sent um, you an email with a blorf. Right, I have that one to upload, and I have the other one he just sent, too. Oh, Justin's been falling down on the job with the emojis, guys. We need a blorf. Yeah. I'm sure to blorf today, because I'm, like, doing stuff I've never done before. Well, at least part of it will be stuff I've never done before. Hello, image of betrayal. Planar crossroads, blorf is my thing. It's, it's whenever I make a mistake and the paint goes somewhere it shouldn't, I say I made a blorf. So... We wanted kind of a, a paint splash spoogey emoji or emoji. So every time I see Blorf, we, people can Blorf. <laughs> you can Blorf along with me, which is great. Yes, happy hump day. Yes, it's nice that we get a shorter week, at least those of us in the USA. Uh, so it's already only two days till Friday, which makes me happy. Blorf. Yes, Blorf is a great word. Technical term, don't you know? So how is everybody today? Shalom, Stefan, or Stephen, or that guy. I'll just call you that guy. But then we can't say, like, don't be that guy, because you could be really cool, and so then maybe we want to be that guy. I don't know. That's very confusing. <laughs> maybe I call you 93. <laughs> uh, alrighty. So cool. Cool, cool, cool. I guess people are here kind of trickling in, like Steve B. Steve B. Yeah. God Emperor Bob. So, God Emperor Bob, what we are doing today is, uh, I don't know if I, uh, you uh, came in uh, in any of my earlier streams, but I've been working on a Reaper Spirit Beast, and uh, yesterday I sculpted some water, so today I want to talk about the colors that I use for water, typically, and I also want to talk about, um, like, using some special effects stuff, so uh, stuff like water effects and realistic water. Um, to get a better, you know, get, get a different effect on your water. If you're sculpting it like I am, if you're not just doing it with a product. Um, so I wanted to work with that. And then if we get enough, if we get through enough, I have another product that I was maybe going to test out and see if I could use to make a tree limb on the other side of here in the water where I haven't sculpted it yet. Um, and yeah, we got stuff. We got stuff. I'm just playing around with spirit beast base, but it's pretty much water base today. Uh, playing, continuing to play with water base. Um, and the nice thing about using green stuff to sculpt your water is that you don't have to work with heated epoxies or pouring or any of that sort of stuff. Um, so I like that. I like that aspect. So this is like a method that I use a lot. If I'm going to use just a little bit of water on a base, if I just want a little bit of water effect, um, I've used it to great effect in the past, uh, with, you know, it looks pretty decent, I think. So we're going to see, I'm going to play around with a new technique on this today though, to see what I can do with it. Alrighty. Oh, the pot, the, 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 uh, spink, sp <laughs> the bot is very naughty. Well, the bot's been naughty for a while, planer. Um, so, hey, Trouble. I'm glad Trouble is here. We can now, I don't know, I guess, just embrace Trouble. <laughs> Everybody needs a hug, right? <laughs> well, definitely Discord was Trouble this morning. So, Trouble, you were, you and Discord were synonymous this morning. 
Ah, all right. Hey, Nomad Zeke, how's it going? All right, so let's, yeah, let's get into it. Let's uh, let's go over here and wander around and do some stuff um, and get into camera land. Make miniatures, stand by. Poof. Well, while Justin and, uh, yes, give it time and issues will arise. And with Discord, they'll arise sooner rather than later. Um, so, all right, let's play with our little spirit beast. Let's get him. I got to fix my autofocus. Let me get my auto we focus in focus and fix it. Let's see how close I can get. That's a little out of focus. Let's do this and get him completely in focus at a level I can actually work on him at. There we go. Nice and sharp. Yeah, and there's a lot of reopening. I guess, you know, summertime and, and Disney, I can see in some cases would be pretty safe, right? It's they're outdoors. They're an outdoors venue for a lot of it. And that risk is minimized in hot weather outdoors and sunny weather. And that's Florida, right? And, and SoCal, I guess, also. Um, so it makes sense. Uh, but I don't know. Some states, I mean, out here in California, things seem to be picking up rather than slowing down. And that worries me. So at least in Southern um, so yeah, we'll see. We'll see. But I do think what I, what I kind of think is that school should have summer school, but do outside classes. I think that makes a lot more sense than kids going and sitting in enclosed classrooms, but that's just me and I am not an expert. Yeah. Well, all companies are hemorrhaging monies. I'm, but yeah, beef is, I'm, I'm with you on that is everybody, if they can, if they could do it, they're going to do it. And we're going to see what the consequences are. Maybe there won't be. I mean, like I said, mostly outdoor venue. Uh, if people observe social distancing, if they limit the attendance cap, like at um, Six Flags, I used to work at a Six Flags park, actually. And, you know, on days when there were only 20,000 people in the park, it was pretty, you know, you could social distance pretty effectively, but not on days when there were 45,000 in the park. So maybe they'll cap their attendance uh, or their uh, or the number of tickets per day or something. All right, let's do this. Let's get some water. So there are lots of colors you can use for water. Depending on what kind of water you're doing, obviously. Let me get out some of my faves for various types of water. All right, so let's talk about water. If you are doing still or swampy water or very um, shallow puddles or, uh, oh, let me think, rivers that are rivers or streams that are quite shallow, um, you tend to want to go more browns and greens. What you're looking at there is you're looking at the natural brown of the stream bed and it's almost always going to be dark because it's, you know, the earth, what earth there is, is mud essentially. So you're using like a muddy color, black and brown, muddy brown, any of those will work. Um, and the green in that case is usually, uh, algae or like, um, tiny vegetation in the water and that's what you're dealing with in swamps obviously this is accentuated so you can go very green with your water in swamps um you could go green and black depending on how much light there is in the swamp in uh you know if there's obviously if there's sunlight the water will look more green and if there's not sunlight the water will appear more black so keep that in mind when you're doing that um, subterranean pools, I would go for a black or a blue black probably just because if there's no light, um, you'd want to consider like what your light source is, uh, and what you want to do. But I mean, underground streams tend to look black. Um, they don't have vegetation in the water really because yeah, obviously it's underground. So kind of think about where your stream or your water is and kind of make that decision accordingly. Oh, let's see here. Um, I actually used mint green. If you wanted to use more blue than green, I might use surf aqua in Ara. Um, cause if, if you look at my, like, cause I was using like kind of around the phantom glow or the mint green, right. And the next step over would probably be surf aqua. You know, it's, it's still got green in it, but it's more blue and less green. You could also take uh, phantom and mix just a tiny bit of clear blue into it. That works too. Yep, Sir Aqua. So really, uh, Sir Forscale and Sir, Fra Sir Aqua need to get together. Is that it? Yeah. Good deal. Just kind of like keeping up with uh, chat here. Hold on. Hey, Mephophile. Uh, yeah, so that was probably what I would lean toward. Or I would do a mixture um, in our and do that and then use some clear blue mixed in for for darker colors and glaze with clear blue or cyan 
um, instead of going with uh, with the colors that uh, I was doing, which is the magenta. Now, if you are working more with this color in RI, you won't get the cool shift with the magenta that I did. Um, it doesn't work with blues. Um, it'll just turn them purple, which maybe you want. So, but if you're, uh, the weird color effect that I was getting by layering the magenta over the, uh, greens, you will not get with phthalo blue. You got points, Reaper Collins? I don't know what that means. Just ignore it. Okay. Just ignore it. It's fine. Yeah. Um, as far as, uh, Surf Aqua Mini, uh, I think that would have to be a water knight. Don't you think, guys? Like, it sounds like that would be a thing. 20. There we go. Like, maybe a water elemental in armor or something. Yeah, I think a water elemental in armor would be pretty cool. Oh. Also, uh, mm. Thank you for the uh, kind email there, Planer. I appreciate it. Yay. Anyway, so let's put our Surf Aqua and our Phantom Glow over here. So, okay. So, yeah. So, swampy water puddles, anything like that. Um, if you're doing puddles on concrete, then I'd go with the same color as the concrete, only darker. So like if you were doing, um, doing a particular, say you were doing cloudy gray for concrete, I would probably go with stormy gray and then glaze, like glaze, put a little bit of brown in it, uh, maybe a thin glaze of the swamp green and then put your gloss or your, uh, or your water effects on it. Um, so that's, that's still water. Now we are not dealing with still water. We're dealing with river water. Blarf. Oh, wow. Well, the blurf is a little hard to read, but it, it, it translates. So we've got blurfs. Yeah, Swamp Green is my favorite dark green. Uh, if you got the Dungeon Dwellers, however, uh, Troll Hide is very close to this. It's lighter and greener, but it's, it's close. So it can be used uh, as a similar color, but Swamp is, swamp is my fave. Um, so I highly recommend getting a bottle of Swamp Green, 9175 at some point it is useful oh. if you hmm? oh sorry i was gonna tell trash roman to check his email oh okay uh... but go ahead yeah okay yeah so swamp green and troll are very similar if you're on my patreon i just did a five dollar uh, pdf uh this month about those first three colors in dungeon dwellers my patreon is patreon.com slash painting big and I do a lot of PDFs about Master Series paint, especially at the $5 level. That is your sweet spot if you're looking for paint info and color theory. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, Swamp Green, I just I just went over a troll hide and gave some of the uh, uses for it. And I mentioned that Swamp Green is similar. Um, thank you for linking the Patreon there in chat planer. Awesome. Yay. Yeah, a lot of those Dungeon Dwellers paints are very useful. Um, troll hide is a lot more transparent paint. Um, I was playing with it in our, and you're absolutely right. What you mentioned the other week about how the coverage isn't the best. And the part of that is that I wanted the vibrancy of the color greens, uh, green and black have fairly, uh, low pigment grinds as do yellow. So they just don't block the light as effectively. So they just tend to be, uh, more transparent unless you load white into them. And I wanted the richness of the color. I didn't want to put white in it. Excellent. Oh, do we have a clever crow too? We do. Yeah. Do you see the little circle there? Oh, he's okay. Oh, yeah. He's tiny. There he it's is. It's good. It's good. I like it a lot. Good deal. Awesome. So let's talk about river water. Um, for river water, usually, you definitely you you usually go bluish with it, obviously, because it's usually reflecting the sky. Um, the blues that you want to use are actually more in the greenish spectrum. And when you're dealing with Reaper Master Series, the greenish spectrum is usually found, greenish spectrum blues are usually found in bones, like oceanic blue, tropical blue, all those blues have a, have a shift toward green. Don't use something like ultramarine. It actually has a shift toward purple, um, a little bit toward the red shade. You can kind of see the difference. It's very hard to see the difference. Um... But, uh, but essentially cyan is a, a warmer blue. So of the master series paints, if I need a deeper blue, I will use cyan. If I don't, the other one you can use is of course the, the clear phthalo blue that was a reaper current color. That is a, uh, green shade phthalo blue. So it works great. Clear phthalo blue. That is the darkest potential, but also has very little coverage. So you essentially want to paint with your higher, higher coverage paint and then glaze your shadows in when you need a darker blue. Um, 
inevitably with ocean water, you also see a shift toward green. Uh, and you can get a little bit of that on river water just because of sunlight um, and the reflection of the sky. The sky is not always as, you know, sometimes has a tinge of green in it. So that's why I kind of usually these would be my colors that around here is where I'd go. Um, surf aqua, again, extremely useful because it just is. So let me put back my ultramarine blue. And put back my swamp green and my black and brown. Um, in a pinch, if you don't have clear phthalo blue and you need a dark shadow, use clear blue. If you don't have that, you can use ultramarine shadow. Uh, or you could use brilliant blue. I would not use Ritter Lake blue or void blue or any of those because they have black in them and it won't look right on water. Um, doo -doo -doo. Tropical storms, fun, fun. Is that what they're naming them now? That's kind of crazy. Lots of rain. We are having really dry, hot weather here. It was uh, 90. When I went for my walk yesterday at 6 p.m., it was uh, 93 here in the South Bay, which feels good to me. David thought it was nuts. <laughs> but I'm like, this is great weather for walking. And he's like, uh, no. <laughs> but I'll tell you, there, was very, there were very few people. I had to dodge very few people on my walk because I was one of the only people crazy enough to be walking at 93 degrees. All right. All right, cool. So let's look at this and let's uh, let's start with it. And then, of course, we want our pure white for a little foamy, foamy tops. So we'll do that. Let's start with our tropical blue. I could start with oceanic, too, but we'll see. I think I'm just going to use um, cyan and uh, bring in some shadows. So we'll pop some of that in there. I want to use it almost full strength. Probably will use it full strength over green stuff. Shake well. Um, as mentioned before, you don't have to prime your green. You can just paint over it. So usually I will do that. Unless I feel like priming. But I seldom feel like priming. <laughs> Laziness. Y'all get to see how lazy Anne is. Now, Tropical Blue is very... Uh, I mean, it has some coverage, but it's still not like perfect coverage out of the gate. That's just because blues tend to be more transparent. So I'll put it on in a fairly thick layer, and it'll mostly cover everything. Uh, and I'll probably just have to do a touch up. And honestly, having a little bit of the green show through isn't bad because river water, but I will, I will cover it all. I like to, I don't like to leave my green showing through just as a happenstance. If I want green in the water, I like to paint green in the water, so. So first we block in, usually, and usually I will block in more of a, hmm, I should remove tail. Uh oh, I've greened the tail to the, <laughs> Well, I can break it free later. <laughs> I was afraid of that. I was afraid my tail would stick uh, stick in the green stuff. Now I'm going to have to like uh, totally extricate it later. Ah, oh no, a blorf. Blorf. All right, blorf emoticon, please. Blorf emoji. Um, Twisted Oma, no, it's about the same. It's actually surprisingly humid in the South Bay. We're not that far from the water. We're only about 45 minutes from water, from the ocean. So we still get a lot of humidity. Um, Blorf, thank you, Blorfs. Uh, but yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, except for the heavy robes. It's never a good day for graduation when it's hot. So you sit there and swelter. It's like they want to torture you one last time before they release you. And I'm going to kind of not paint this little green edge up here because I'm not done with doing the water on this side. So it wouldn't really matter. I could green over it and it would stick to the paint just fine. But let me get my glasses out. Where are they? There they are. Uh, I just don't like to prime if it's not strictly necessary. I've gotten spoiled. And then when I do prime, I tend to use a spray primer unless it's... Uh, a very, very weird weather day out where it's just not going to work. So as I do my base coat, I'm going to get a sense of how smooth my water sculpt actually was yesterday. And I do want to cover all of the water with the blue in general. If you do blorf, 
be aware you can always use your fingernail to just kind of scratch it off. This is why I don't prime my black bases, by the way. I know a lot of people will put the mini on the base, and they'll prime the base, and they'll paint the ends outside of the base. But uh, I find that uh, if then if I do a blorf, I can't just scrape it off like this with a fingernail. Um, I like the shiny black rim on the base. Um, and I find that if I do paint it black, it's not as good because it was prone to rubbing off, especially on the gaming figure. So I tend to leave my... I, when I've got a black plastic base on a figure, I keep it black plastic. If I'm going to prime, I either brush prime or I spray the figure beforehand. All right, so we're getting that. I'm going to set up my other colors here. Where is my... I'll use cyan since more people can get that. Hey, Stephen Mack. Uh, Mathophile, it is a combo, right? So uh, for one thing, you can do your Zenith Prime, and then you can take a picture of the model, and it's an easy reference for where your highlights and shadows go. Uh, so you can you can utilize this. It, it kind of tells you where things are. But at the same time, it's an imperfect tool on that. Uh, so the other reason people use it, incorrectly most of the time, uh, is uh, that when you start painting over it, the black areas act like black paper and the light areas act like white paper. So you get lighter colors and brighter colors easier where your highlights are. However, a lot of people just kind of ob obliviate that uh, advantage by using thick paint. And so they don't get the advantage after that first coat. They don't get the advantage of the Zenith priming. So that's why Zenith priming is kind of weird to me. Like it makes sense if you're going to use it and then kind of take a picture. Um, or if you're going to paint with really light glazes, if you're going to like, there's a way to speed paint using this, um, where you, you just if, like right now you, you kind of refine it, block it in, do some blending, and then you just glaze over the thing in colors and you can speed paint a model very quickly that way. But most people aren't using it that way. So, you know, when I talked to Sergio about this, I was priming the models for his class and I asked him if I should Zenith and he said, it really doesn't matter. And he's right. It doesn't. If you're using thick paint, like we were in his class. You don't need that zenith. It's pretty much useless after after coat one, unless you take a photo and use it for reference. So that's the dealio with zenith priming. Um, that said, like I said, if you underpaint and then you use thinner paint layers over the top, you can use it to get some cool effects. But a lot of people don't use it that way because a lot of people see it and they just you know paint normally over it. And so it's, it's again, this is like. Uh, ideas that come and go but you never really then people never really explain to you how you're supposed to take advantage of them right and and it's you know to some people it is i guess what they do but again if you're if you're not using thinner paint and you're not taking a photo you're losing the advantage of that zenith uh the minute you finally cover it up with a thick base coat or your second layer which sometimes is enough for people but Paint is opaque. It does block the light. So uh, you really aren't getting a lot of advantage there um, after the first or second coat. But like I said, it is it is good in that if you're going to be using lighter, brighter colors on your highlights, um, it will enable you to more easily get that over white primer while still taking advantage of the black primer shadows to naturally shade your figure, uh, just like black primer and painting over black primer always does. So, you know, it has that advantage. But again, after you get enough solid coats on there, that is no longer a thing. So it really depends. It depends on your painting style. It depends on how you want to use it. Um, I personally find it most useful if I'm using thinner coats of paint and using underpainting. But that's me. But then I don't need it as a highlights and shadows guide because I'm pretty good at imagining where my highlights and shadows are going to go anyway. So really, your mileage may vary. Give it a try. See if it works. If it works for you, use it. This is always the case with miniature painting. Alrighty. Nice, happy, light blue water. But yeah, I mean, Zenith highlighting was popularized, I believe, by the Europeans. I don't remember if it was one country more than another. Um, but you can get some cool effects... Uh, if you, if you kind of accentuate the highlighting that you get from the spray. But my problem with it is that it, as I said, it's imperfect. And what I mean, I actually did a, I think I did a, a video on this and possibly um, for the Patreon. But uh, what I'm talking about is that you can't get things like uh, reflections. Like if you're doing NMM, 
then it's not going to supply reflections at all. And yeah, I did do, do a video on this because I did a Brass and the Mem video for my Patreon using my uh, Creature Caster model. And uh, I used Zenith on it. And I kind of showed people how to utilize Zenith. So if you're on my Patreon and you're, I think it's the $10 level, um, go take a look at that. And I talk about why, you know, because it can't give you the under reflections. It can't give you, you know, a lot of the lights. The It only gives you an overhead light source. And it's not even like a very good overhead light source unless you've got a single source. Or if you're doing a general spray. I mean, yeah, I don't know. And then, of course, it speckles. So then you have to underpaint. Um, or you're just going to paint over it again, block painting. So it's, I'm, I'm really split on it. I don't consider it necessary. I like the look of the model after I prime it. Sometimes I work with it. Sometimes I'm just annoyed at it. <laughs> it really varies. I've experimented with it on a couple of models at this point, And I find that really your mileage really does vary with it. Um, the best results that I've had with it have been using thinned paint, taking advantage of the white paper, black paper dichotomy, um, and working up very gently in layers, but that's pretty time consuming too. All right, so we've got our, our blue water. Already our water looks more blue for being blue, which is nice. Maybe I'll put some shadows. I don't know. I'll do some highlights. All right, so I'm going to thin my paint a fair bit. Where is my water? Here it is. Having a dropper bottle of water is always very useful. I thin it uh, close to one to one. It's maybe one point three to one. I wasn't tracking my drops uh, when I put in the surf aqua. But yeah, pretty much prime however you like. I mean, just be aware that over white primer, you know, you're going to have to put your shadows in over or or light gray. I like light gray primer personally. Um, and over black primer, it will naturally make your paint look a little darker out the gate until you build up several layers. Um, if you have a very high coverage paint, it may only take a couple layers to overcome that. Uh, but most people who use black primer are utilizing that, like by leaving the black, um, like only thinly going over the black in the shadows and then just leaving that there to naturalize, uh, to, to create a natural shadow. So I'm going to kind of go along where my wavelets go. And I'm going to kind of do a little bit of streaking as it comes up, leave some streaks of paint um, as it comes up toward the top of a crest. And I'm going to paint everything light up where it's thin. So surf aqua. I usually start with highlights on water and then I go back and add shadows where I think I need to kind of define wave shapes a little bit more or where it's, um, no, it's not an OSL thing. I mean, I mean, it's, it's just a, a lighting thing in general. Um, that's a file like Zenith priming is supposed to, uh, represent natural daylight. Like it's your, your, you know, you're spraying down in generalistic way, just like sunlight would come down. Um, you can also use an airbrush and make it an OSL tool. And, but at that point it's not Zenith lighting anymore. It's just underpainting. Um, because zenith lighting, zenith is above lighting going down. So, yeah. Yeah, painted here is fine to green stuff, Krispies. I mean, if I'm if it's going to be on an area that I'm going to touch all the time, then I probably would prime. But otherwise, if it's an area that's seldom going to get fingers on it, it's not really going to rub off. And again, I'm going to kind of go streaky, kind of bring up this little wavelet. You can always come back and grab my tropical blue. Kind of blend that in. And when I'm doing my brush strokes, I want to kind of mimic the flow of the water. So I want to use a long sweeping stroke with my highlighting strokes to kind of bring out. See, I'm starting to bring out that water now. And uh, kind of, you could stipple your lines. You could just kind of, you know, to make them a little rougher. Um, keep in mind where your shadows are likely to be and where your highlights are likely to be. At the top of each of these little waveforms, I know I'm going to have some foam, so I want to keep those light and I kind of want to emphasize that as I'm painting them. And you can stipple a bit because if it's rough water, it's going to like have lots of tiny little wavelets in it. Um, oh, Kurniko, I know shopping takes so long. I went yesterday and I lost half the day. 
Um, I mean, on the plus side, we have lots of tasty food now to cook for the last several, the next several days. But David and I split the shopping. He does uh, Trader Joe's run on Friday, and I do the Sprouts run on Tuesday. We kind of split it up that way, so we neither one of us has to be the only person running to the store. Because it's stressful, and it takes a long time in these days. So, so stipple, 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 stipple with my syrup aqua. I may make these more a little more linear, a little streakier. Um, kind of bring in my surf aqua around all around the tops of things because I'm going to bring that up to white. Hello, Scalsy. Uh, no, I'm actually I'm gluten free, Nomad Zeke, for for a long time. Ever since I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease, um, I've been on a gluten free. I very seldom allow myself to have gluten. Um, so yeah, I have to make my own pasta. Actually, I'm very looking forward to it. I, for a while, I just didn't have pasta cause I didn't really miss it. Um, but lately, cause David likes to have it cause he likes to make carbonara. So I looked up a homemade pasta recipe for gluten-free and I'm actually looking forward to making my own pasta, which is something I actually always wanted to do because making your own ravioli with whatever filling you want really sounds awesome. Um, but yeah, so I haven't had the chocolate gnocchi. They do sound pretty decadent. I do love gnocchi. I really miss them. Um, really, really. But I can't quite uh, bring myself to order them in a restaurant because, you know, you usually get a gigantic plate of them. And that's just too much. <laughs> too much for my poor diet. All right, so we've got some nice wave shapes coming up here now. See the subtlety? Hold on, let me get in focus. There we go. I wonder if I move this out, will I get a little, no, probably actually show up better if I move the palette a little bit more. Cause this is a light model and it just wants to, there. They aren't visual appealing, but they're pretty, uh, pretty tasty. Yeah, I, I watch my diet pretty tight because of various health things. Um, so I, there are many yummy, tasty things that I can no longer have. Happily, uh, this was a real, influence on me to get me to learn to cook better. So now I, I feel like I'm actually, well, David says I'm a very good cook. Um, I think I can still improve. Obviously anybody can improve, but I really enjoy cooking now. So I have to say that even though the diet meant that I couldn't have some of the things I used to like, um, I was able to turn that around and learn to make on diet versions of stuff I like. Yeah, when you've got good health, I mean, never underestimate the fact that you can eat whatever you want, guys. Like, seriously, if you have that, uh, thanks, Pillionaire, I see, I see you sent me a gluten-free gnocchi recipe. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if you can eat whatever you want, enjoy it, man, because, like, you never know. Like, I wasn't expecting to get a chronic health issue and suddenly have to drop a whole bunch of stuff out of my diet, right? So... You never expect it. Enjoy it while you can. That I also, uh, I went, as many of you know, I went keto to uh, for two years to lose weight successfully. Lost like 60 pounds. Um, so I also eat low carb. Um, I got very used to eat that eating lifestyle and I really love it. So that also means I make, I use a lot of almond flour or coconut flour in my baked goods. Um, so that that's a little challenging. Okay, that's a little strong. Let's mix that a little bit with uh, that. I'm grabbing some white so I can do some, test out some foamy effects here. Now you want to use a stipply effect if you're doing foaminess because the foam would be kind of speckly and we're going to um, emphasize that with our water effects in a little bit. So what I'm doing, the reason I'm painting under this is that even if I'm using the water effects to create some flying like kind of stipply rough uh, wet foam, I want that color underneath so that the color still looks right when I put down the water effects. So that's why we're kind of underpainting because the water effects is gonna go down opaque, but it's gonna dry clear. So stippling anywhere where the water looks at all rough then the finer dots you can get the better, um, just kind of looks like flecks of foam on the surface. And so yeah, brush tip fine, very little paint on the brush, little tiny dots, little tiny dots. Um, yeah, lately, Crohn's was a tentative diagnosis, and there have been some things that have come up that um, make my doctors feel like maybe Crohn's is the wrong form of IBS, like it's something else, but um, uh, oh, we're just, we're, I'm just running with it. Like, whatever I have, I know that uh, keto, going low-carb or keto or uh, 
and gluten-free has really helped how my guts feel and that's really the important thing. So whatever I have, whatever form of crazy I have, be it Crohn's or something else, I just try to, I mean, I can successfully control it more or less with diet. I, I have a couple of meds or one med that I take and then I take some heavy hardcore probiotics. Um, Um, they're not the same thing, Kroner, but uh, they use IB, what did they, they do use IBS and IBD and say that Crohn's is a form of those sometimes, depending on the doctor you talk to, um, because it's all the digestive tract and Crohn's just, you know, affects the colon uh, more and there are some other things, but they also say that Crohn's can affect the stomach. And can, can affect the whole digestive tract and the small intestine. So it's it's very, there's a lot of blurred area in talking to doctors. Um, so, you know, maybe your doctor or, or you know, some sites are now saying that Crohn's is not related to these. I don't know. It's, and it gets all weird, right? Because like celiac and Crohn's have, seem to have a genetic link. Uh, celiac is the thing that makes you not able to eat gluten, by the way, guys, if you don't know. So, yeah, I mean, it's all, you know, who are you going to believe, right? That's why I just try to control it. Uh, you have an atypical Crohn's. Yeah. Yeah. I have a something, um, something weird. And, uh, for now we are calling it Crohn's. But I just try to control it as much with diet as I can. Mostly successfully. I haven't, uh, had to take my meds the other day, but uh, mostly for the last couple months, I haven't had to really take as much as I have before. So it's just figuring out the new normal. But yeah, so for the rest of you who can enjoy your gluten and your alcohol and your, uh, and your crazy, uh, you know, tasty croissants and, uh, uh, all the rest of it, uh, enjoy it. Enjoy it. I, I wish I was you still. I did get in plenty of good food before I, uh, before I was limited as to what I could eat. So I, I did, uh, did get the experience, but, uh, I'm okay. I can sit and watch David eat his croissant in the morning and I really don't, you know, feel like I have to have any. And so that's a, that's victory right there. See, we're stippling up some water. Yeah, I'm with you. Uh, yeah, exactly. In our inflammatory diseases are highly individual and yeah, and vary by the person, right? Like every, so one person's well, Crohn's can rep, can present in several different ways. So, and that's makes it hard for doctors. Like they're really doctors are more uh, working with the healthcare system for over the last. I think I was first. Uh, I had my first issue in uh, 2013, so it's been a while now. But in working with the health care system and several surgeries over the last uh, seven years, I have learned that doctors in many ways are like detectives. So that house show, although dramatization, isn't far off. It's a detective show set in the hospital. And actually, if you look at it, a lot of what doctors do is detective work. They're trying stuff. They're tra testing hypotheses. They're trying to get you what you need. Um, but uh, yeah, the information, and as you say, the information changes so swiftly and sometimes some doctors have beliefs that they're not willing to let go of, just like, you know, they're human. And, you know, you really just got to find a doctor who really drives with you and your lifestyle, which is why I haven't been able to hook up with a new doctor out here yet because, you know, all the crazy going on. But uh, I'm really going to kind of look for one that believes in my lifestyle because I have encountered ones who believe that what you eat has no effect on your health, like as far as like keeping you healthy or not healthy. And I just can't deal with those people. Yeah, but I think it's not far off methophile because I think doctors really, really are uh, detectives in a lot of ways. That's cool though, that it used to be, that it was Sherlock Holmes. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, that's in that's crazy twisted oma like i i like feel for you it's uh it's so sad that you know some the I, i'm glad that now we've got some other treatments but even then some people have to the things that some people have to suffer through because of these autoimmune disorders and and uh 
and inflammatory disorders. It's just terrible. It influences your whole life. It influences your entire mindset. It, uh, there was a time when I, when they couldn't fix me for a while, several years of surgery. And, uh, I thought I was never going to be normal again. And it, it gets you. It really does. It feeds on you. So all of the sympathies, all of the love. All right, I'm going to actually put my white palette under this so you guys can hopefully see some of the cool patterns I'm doing. Let me get in focus. Come here, focus cam. Give me in focus. Yeah, there we go. So I'm kind of doing... Do you remember how we did... Here, I'll paint it on this. So you remember how we were talking about how waves kind of move in like circle, interconnected circles, you know, and, uh, and the water on David's base was kind of like interconnected circles kind of like that because it's wavelets right so you have you have tops and troughs and the waves are going into each other and it's usually kind of a very random chaotic uh, irregular pattern so that kind of thing is what I'm doing in white or in pale blue on the top of this wave I'm trying to get that that watery effect oh fibro oof oh sweet yeah planar uh big hugs big hugs. So I know so many people with so many issues and that's a triple whammy right there. I know I have a friend with fibromyalgia and it's just nasty. I sometimes wonder if fibro is somewhat related to lupus because I had a friend who had lupus and a friend with fibro and a lot of the symptoms were very similar. But yeah, the best you can do is just get through the day and find things that you can still enjoy. So that you can still live life to the fullest. And to not dwell on the stuff that you can't do anymore. And that's really was key for me in changing my diet. Because my husband at the time like really didn't change his diet at first. And then he, he later came by and he did. He actually went keto with me. Because I started losing a crap ton of weight. Um, but it's hard when you're surrounded by people you know, who can still do everything. All the things you can't do. And you got to not let it feed on you. It's hard. Like, I've, I've gotten pretty enlightened at this point, you know, that David can, can eat glutinous things. And most of the time, you know, sometimes I'll have a tiny nibble of it, but most of the time it just kind of reaffirms to me that I don't need it, which is nice. Interesting, yeah. I just, I just, you know, I can eat gluten, but I choose not to because my guts feel better when I don't, so... So I can glutenate every once in a while and not have too bad of an effect. But if I ate it on a regular basis, I think that would be a very bad idea. Mostly I'm just trying not to get any more blips. <laughs> so here we are. So here's our water. See, coming up. Got a light. Uh, I, I want it to have a lot of froth in it when it comes up to this top of this wavelet. So, and I'm going to put some shadow color down here in the next trough. Um, so I'm mostly trying to emphasize my highlights here and kind of bring that in. Um, I'm slowly going up to white. I do need to drop more water in my white because it's very strong. You don't want to get these big blobs when you're putting down the white. You want it thinner so you can build it up and make it look like foam. And a way to do that Yeah, I never get into the sprouted grains. I just went gluten-free completely because that was kind of my shtick. Uh, sprouted or not sprouted doesn't really make a difference for me. Um, I just wanted to get out of the habit of eating gluten. And and I found that pretty easy because I've never been a bread -ivore. Um, I've never really, like, loved bread to the exclusion of, you know, like some people adore bread and cannot imagine giving it up. And I actually found it fairly easy to give up bread. Um, and what I do like is baked goods like cookies and muffins, but these days there's such good gluten-free flour mixes, and then I can even do it with almond flour. I have my own custom mix, so. So that's all very nice. So, yeah, but, yeah, it's good that you can eat the sprouted stuff. That's, uh, that's cool. They even have some of that in, in grocery stores. Although it's expensive, so if you can make your own, it's definitely worth it, I imagine. All right, there, we've got some really nice foam striping. See that? So this kind of pattern, it's just kind of random. I just did little striations, a couple of little bubbles of, uh, you know, kind of trailing off foam here. 
I love randomized patterns. Uh, I love doing patterns that trying to look make a pattern that looks natural. So it's uh, it's really fun. And if you do something and it doesn't look quite right, then just go back and redo it. But I think that's looking quite nice on this this uh, wave right here. Yeah, that's how David is, Valandar. Uh, he loves pasta. And I, I could care about pasta, too. Like, actually, except for beer, um, and now they make decent gluten remove brands, uh, you know, beer and uh, crackers. Crackers were my, my evil that I had to give up. Um, and, of course, I had to kind of give those up for low-carb, too, unless I use, make almond flour crackers. But the, the low-carb crackers are pre-made are just so bloody expensive. Um, but, yeah, I feel you because about how you feel about pasta was how I felt about crackers and... Only going keto finally cured me of my cracker uh, cracker dependency. Because I just couldn't find any good ones, and I didn't want to make them because they were a pain in the butt. Uh, so I finally broke it. Although what I do love, because I can have some resistant starches now, I do love those Terra chips, the ones that are like plantain chips or, uh, or like the various like beets and things like that, sweet potatoes. I like those. I have to kind of control myself on how many I eat, but... Those are really tasty if you haven't had them. If you haven't ever had the Terra uh, chips, try the Mediterranean variety. It's got a variety of root veggies instead of potatoes. Um, and uh, it's a bit lower carb, uh, lower sugars than uh, potato chips. And all sorts of different textures. And the Mediterranean seasoning is like lemon, garlic, and herbs. It's really good. So now, look at We've got our water. It's looking pretty good. Tomatoes are my evil. That's my trigger planner. My Crohn's thing. Um, my guts get really unhappy with uh, tomatoes. So, Which is okay because uh, David and I have started making pesto. <laughs> we slaughtered one basil plant already and we're looking to slaughter two. So I had to buy two more uh, when I was at the store this week. Um, but uh, I do love pesto, so now I can make a killer homemade pesto. We actually made a mint pesto, and that was amazing. I was surprised. It was so good. So that's what I used for the sauce. We made, uh, I used keto uh, crusts, and uh, we made pizza uh, the week over the weekend. It was the first pizza I've had in, like, <laughs> a couple of years, I think. But uh, it was really tasty. And there are still leftovers. I think we're eating leftovers tonight. Good. Yeah, Twisted Oma. I, I believe very strongly that, too, because I have been able to control my condition with diet, largely. So I, I have to say that I also believe in that power. Um, try, try finding some alternate gluten-free breads that you might like. Um, I mean, it depends, I guess. Sometimes you just can't. I believe that, uh, almond flour helps a lot in some of the textures, I think. But of course, it's high calorie and higher fat, so it depends on what you're doing. Since I was on keto, which is a high fat diet, I don't really care about fat. I'm more watching overall calories and how I feel. Um, And I'm just going to make some more little frothies to kind of like lead up to this foam up here. There we go. And again, we're trying to keep our strokes kind of sweeping in the same direction as the water is moving. And I'm going to come down here, bring up a little bit of a suggestion of texture down here. Get a little bit more of my wavelets going down there. You see how we're, how we're really starting to come up? I'm actually liking the look of this right now. Uh, so I'm going to do a little bit of patterning over here, and then I'm going to get my shadows. Let's get some shadows out. We need some darker colors. Yep, calories in versus calories out. I just like, uh, I'm doing, I'm doing my usual in our, my Da Vinci Maestro uh, Series 10 size one, uh, which is apparently very similar to a Winsor Newton Series 7 uh, Zero, I think, uh, and very, very similar in shape and size. Um, not the miniature series, the regular series seven, I should say. Uh, David whipped out one the other day. We compared them. They're actually very similar. That mine is maybe a little more narrow and a little more long with the Da Vinci. Um, but I do love it for fine detail. Doing those tiny micro dots, it just can't be beat. Um, oh, no. Yeah, yeah, our people are good. They just, hopefully they'll catch it for you there. 
Krispies. All right, so we were using Tropical Blue for our main blue. We were using Surf Aqua plus Surf Aqua and White for our highlights. And now we're going to go and use Cyan Blue, which is a blue that I really like to use. Um, Clear Thalo also, again, would be a great one if you've got it from ReaperCon. Um, the Cyan Blue has the advantage of covering a little bit better if you're using it for a base coat for something. If you want a greenish blue that has a little better coverage, Cyan's good. Um, but you don't necessarily need coverage for what we're doing here because we're going to thin it down to be transparent. So I could go with either of these. And Cyan is a little bit lighter, so I'm going to go with this. That and I want to use colors that are available readily to everybody and not just the few people who might have them from ReaperCon. So Cyan Blue is a great watercolor. Yeah, I'm a huge almond, uh, almond flower fan. Most of my flower mixes have a lot of almond, a bit of coconut, um, cuts down on the carbs a lot. And then when I use white rice flour for, you know, another component, then I don't add too many carbs with it. So it's all carb control for me. And calories. All right, let's get on camera. Oh, yeah. Mm, macarons. Yum, 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 yum. Yum, yum, yum. Yum, 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 yum. There is an almond flour that's out there that's interesting that I'll mention. A lot of people don't know it exists. It's made by the Sucrin company, and it's uh, Mendelmel. It's, it's defatted almond flour. So if you find that when you're trying to do almond flour stuff and it's too heavy and too greasy because there's a lot of fat in almonds, if you get this defatted almond flour, it actually, it's high protein. It's almonds. It's low carb because almonds, but it doesn't have the fat content. It's a lot finer, and it works a lot better as like, like a traditional wheat flour. Um, it's super fine. It's expensive, but I do uh, buy it, and then I essentially use regular almond flour and that almond flour. I mix them together, um, and it really helped me nail my Christmas cookies and make them taste just like mom's and have the right consistency. Because um, I do some, she's got a cookie cutter cookie recipe that I love, um, and so I want I needed a finer flour for that. I couldn't have a crumbly texture for those. Uh, so yeah, Sucrine Company defatted almond flour. And that's something you can't just make in a blender because obviously they've removed a bunch of the fat from it. Okay, so cilantro. I was just, uh, David and I have been playing the, the downloadable content from Borderlands 3. Have you guys played the Cthulhu one? Because, oh my god, they have a cilantro joke in there. <laughs> the vilest herb. <laughs> Only the Necronomicon wants it. <laughs> it's just awesome. Like, if you have not, it's like, uh, Love and Tentacles, I think it's the marriage of Hammerlock and, uh, and, uh, what's his name? And Jacobs. And, uh, it's a fantastic, like, if you like Cthulhu, oh my god, you must play it. It's like, they took Cthulhu, threw in Borderlands, and made it comedy. It's so good. Like, I don't want to finish playing it. It's so good. Yeah. Yeah, almonds have, they do have, um, almonds have a plant toxin in them called oxalate. And some people react to it. And it can, uh... Uh, they mostly they don't put you on a low oxalate diet unless you have kidney stones because sometimes oxalate will cause kidney stones um, but some people do react to that uh, memcc war so maybe that's maybe that's what you're getting on the almonds thing almonds have more oxalate in them than almost any other food i don't react to that although i did cut down on how much i was eating since i was using a lot of almond flour at one time uh, so i cut down cut back on that i try to watch the plant toxins when I can. All right, let's get some shadows in here. Yeah, I think it's genetic, Twisted Oma. Um, I've, David and I were talking about this after we played the game, after we were Borderlands 3 and the, uh, the Nibble Namacon uh, wanted lots of cilantro, unholy cilantro in its recipe. Um, at least it is that sort of thing where you can include it or not. Like, you can always... Whenever you've got something that requires a lot of cilantro, you could always throw in Italian parsley or something. Like like I make curry paste, and it calls for a lot of cilantro, um, homemade curry paste. And so I will, I'll usually put it in, but I could also just always sub Italian parsley, and it would be okay. And it wouldn't give you that soapy flavor. It's a different, different flavor then, but, you know, it gives you some flexibility. So I'm going to put some shadow, I'm going to stipple it in behind the wavelets on the back side just to give us a little bit more contrast so the water has a little bit more depth to it 
And we could put a little bit of another color in there as well if we wanted to. You can eat other nuts, MCC War? Yeah, almonds are particularly the ones with the oxalate, the high oxalate. They're weird that way. You can actually die from oxalate poisoning, but you have to try. Like, you'd have to eat, like, crazy amounts. All right. Let's see here. Put a nice dark shadow behind this wave, so we're, we're adding in some uh, some darker color now. And if I find that it's too um, one-dimensional, I can come back within maybe with, with a little bit of green and add a different color or even a little bit of brown if I want. Uh, let me see here. Let me see what I can do. Let me grab my swamp green. And I that. And maybe a little bit of a lighter brown. Let me see what I got here. What do I got? What do I got? What do I got? Uh, no, that's too rich. I want something that's more like the bottom of a riverbed. Let's see. Sadly, I don't have shield brown right here. I was hoping I would come up with something. I have all these really orangey browns because that's what I like. <laughs> and I'm like, dang it, I need a, I need a weird a brown that's not so orangey. We'll try rich leather. Oh, good. Yeah, most of the gluten-free stuff, planar, I find that's the case. You can really play around with it and tune it. Um, since none of them have gluten, you can get a little bit more uh, liberal with them because they act. a lot of them act the same. It's just how fine the grind is, how much fat is in, in each of them or not in them is the difference. So, all right, so I've got some swamp green, and I've got some, uh, I'm using rich leather. And I decided that my water looks very one-dimensional and I want a couple other colors in there. So the, where, where you want to put those is in the shadow and you want to thin them down a lot. Man, I stopped eating out just to conserve money. <laughs> but I agree with you. It's hard to find. I mean, it's hard to know how much calories are in stuff. It's hard to know what, what ingredients might be in. When you've got food sensitivities of any sort, eating out can be a minefield. So I'm going to add just a little bit of green in some of these dark areas, some of the swamp green, and I'm going to concentrate it really in the shadows. But adding that is going to make it look like more three-dimensional. Like it's going to give it, it's not going to be just blue anymore. Because that's the thing is when you're using just one color for shadows and midtones and highlights, things can look very flat and not realistic. Because, you know, in, in normal life, if you look at a river, you got a lot of different colors in there. Got some greens, got some browns. Got some grays and blues. So if I come in and I kind of glaze in some green, especially maybe near over here near the rocks, and maybe a little bit of brown as well. Let's see if I can get some brown over there. It makes sense to put it near the rocks because um, it's more likely the riverbed is closer to the surface there. So you could get um, a more interesting shadow because the rocks are right there. So as you can see, that's, that's put quite a deep shadow in there because I've layered up some brown and green. And that gives us a lot more drama when you look at that, that deep shadow now underneath the tail. Um, so let's work with some brown here. And since this is a somewhat orangey brown, it is a complement to the blue. So it is going to dull it down. It's not going to be as bright, brilliant of a deep blue in the, in the eddies here anymore, in the, in the depths. We're just adding some interesting color more visual interest because normal water would have a little bit of that and I'm mostly i'm going to stick to the shadows just do light glazes and it'll start looking a lot less flat a lot less flat just a couple touches here and there and now suddenly the color the water looks more natural it looks a lot more naturalistic because i'm introducing those different colors not just flat blue so that's kind of key. And then if I need more blue, if I think I, I lost some of my deeper blue, I can always come back with a glaze of my cyan. If you decide that your water has gone way too green or brown, you could always put, make a glaze of clear blue and put it over the whole thing or of oceanic blue. Um, but I'm liking, I'm liking how this is coming out right now. That's pretty good. 
There. We're getting pretty watery. Okay, now let's play with water effects. Hard to get away from cilantro. Yeah, I agree, Twisted Oma, having just moved away from Texas. Um, yeah, salsa. I, I kind of miss salsa, too, except that I love guacamole. Like, you know, I miss being able to dig into the salsa in restaurants because of the tomato sensitivity. But, but I do love avocados, so at least I've had a replacement uh, condiment for my chips. All righty. So let's do this fun little thing that I thought I would try. I kind of wanted to, do want to take the tail off first, though. There we go. See, I got the tail to pop right off. The nice thing, though, is that now there's a nice... The tail has made a little indent that is tail-shaped here, so it will fit back in just fine when I need it to. It'll sit right where the green kind of set around it. So I still get this great shape where the waves kind of mimic the shape of the tail, which I really like. I really like that this big sluice is coming up and kind of getting the tail. Um, so I'll be able to bring it in. I just need to pop it out and now I can paint it separately still. So that was key, um, in getting all this done. Now let's play around with some water effects. I do need to keep in mind that my tail does fit in there. So I want to put my water effects for the most part on the outside. Um, I'm going to grab a blister top. Any piece of plastic card or plastic bag or anything will do. I just You just want a little tray. You don't want to necessarily put it on your palette because you don't want to have to clean it out of there. A um, little piece of paper that you can throw away, whatever. Um, let me see if I can shake this up a little bit. It's not, it's more of a, a less of, more of a paste and less of a fluid. So sometimes it doesn't want to shake real great. But just like with Master Series paint, keeping it in solution is key to keeping it good. This thing is like over 10 years old. I have had my Woodland Scenics water effects for a very long time. Um, let's grab some, gloop some out onto here. We don't need too much. And then, normally I would use a toothpick, but I've left my toothpicks in the other room with my baking supplies. Foolish me. So let's use the tip of a, skull, a brass rod, really. Just a piece of brass rod or whatever. This is the end of my... Uh, my tiny spoon is on the other end, my tiny spoon sculpting tool, but then I've got just a piece of brass rod on the other end. So, oh, we got bail. Bye, Pendrick. Corn chips are sometimes gluten-free, Pendrick. Got to look at the ingredients. Often they will add flour these days to get a different texture. All right, so we're going to take this, and what we're going to do is we're going to try to pick up little bits of it. And this is just an idea I had, and so I'm wondering if it's going to work. And I'm willing to just try it in front of you guys. Oh, Kiri's got kind of a tail going. Justin, I might need you if my dog decides that she has to go. No problem. Of course, it's right at the end. So let's just wrap this up really quick. But what essentially I'm trying to do here is, let me see. So if you can see, I'm just kind of pulling and pulling away and dipping a little bit of this stuff onto the top of the, the wavelet here. And it's going to give it a shiny, transparent effect and it's going to be a little bit more three-dimensional. So, you know, you can build it up. You could build actually build it up in several layers if you wanted to. Um, but what it's going to give you is that clear. Once it dries, it's white now. But when it dries, it'll be clear. And so you get a little bit of a clear 3D effect on the top of your wavelets. Um, I want to wrap this up quick in case my dog has an emergency. I'd rather do that than come back to the stream for five minutes. So... Just kind of, and you can kind of use the little, it, sometimes it wants to thread and you can use that too. And if you want to, I think you could let this dry and then come back to it tomorrow and build up an even deeper layer and manage to get a true foam-like effect over time. I'm betting you could, uh, cause you need to, you know, you'll need to build it up on a couple different sides, but I think that you could totally do this. And just slowly build up like layers of the clear, uh, clear foam. I think it would work great. Um, I'm already liking how it looks just to do this. Now, since I'm using this and it is a sh does have a shiny finish, guys, I'm going to have to paint this water probably with a gloss sealer or I'm going to have to mat down my foam. It, I'm probably going to just paint the water with a gloss sealer because at this point, it's not like a, it can be fraught with peril if you're doing NMM, but this is a creature. It has no NMM on it. So I can get, uh, let me see if I can get really close here. Hold on. There. But since this creature has no metal on her, I can pretty much 
do uh, do gloss effects, no problem, and not worrying about how it'll look next to an artificial shiny effect like NMM. In general, if you're going to do um, a gloss or metallics or anything like that, you do not want to do NMM and gloss together. It just doesn't look right. Because then you've got this gloss surface. Let's see here. There we go. There it goes in. So you can kind of see the little tendrils coming off the top of my foam there. Um, and I need a towel, paper towel to wipe off my sculpting tool because I've gotten a little bit too much on it. A little bit too much. Then I come down and these got a little regular, so I'm actually going to... And actually, I'm putting such fine little tendrils on that they're already starting to set. But uh, there we go. Uh, the water effect, Woodland Scenics, water effect, water effects, Woodland Scenics. Woodland Scenics is uh, known for all sorts of basing materials. And I was going to talk about another one of their products. Um, but the water effects, I think, are, are the most useful. The other thing that they have is realistic water. If you want to do puddles, this stuff is great. Um, it pour, you pour it in, and it just dries. It shrinks a bit as it does, but uh, so you may have to put in a, a couple of layers if you want a, a deeper puddle, um, because it won't always, you know, it'll, 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 you'll need to put in several layers to build up a flat, glassy surface over a textured uh, base, for example. Um, but it's a nice way to get a little bit more three-dimensionality out. Um, gloss sealers will often serve the same purpose. Uh, and then there's your deep epoxies. If you want to do really deep water, you have to use those typically, the heat and pour um, type of thing. So yeah, let's see here. Let's get up there. There we go. Got very little depth of field right now, so I have to watch to keep in. in the... But yeah, I was also using the Woodland Scenics Water Effects uh, for icicles, if you'll recall. So yeah, I will do a little bit of uh, build up, essentially on my froth of, to give it an extra three dimensionality with clear little bits coming up as if it's really, really having droplets spray. And that should help. And then I can paint some gloss. The other thing is that this will actually leave a little bit of texture. So then it get, makes your foam paintable as far as uh, Getting a little bit of actual texture here. Yeah, and so like you get some things like that little drip that I just got right there. That's going to dry clear and be three-dimensional and hopefully look like water droplets flying up. I like it. Don't want to leave it too spiky. But yeah, I was thinking I would come back and do another layer of this. And once it dries, it's going to show your paintwork through it. I'm already starting to get clearer dries up here, so it's it's um, definitely adding a little bit of three-dimensionality to my surface. This is something I think I'll work with. This is an idea I just had, and I thought I would try it out with you guys. Um, let me get this out of the way, see if I can get everything out here, and zoom in. Nope. Yeah. By the way, that water looks insane, Ann. Oh, like you like that. it? All right, cool. Yay, there we go. Now you can really see it. So, and now I'm getting those little, you can see those little tendrils, little transparent tendrils coming off the top here. Um, so yeah, I think I could maybe build that up into quite a bit of a layer and it would look uh, very foamy. So there, good. So yes, uh, I'm pretty happy with this experiment. I think it will need some more work and development, but I think that it is uh, entirely possible that it will be a great way to get this effect. All right, get a little bit more texture over here. Don't want too many big big blobs. Although, like I said, they will dry clear. So, but if you do see that you get a big blob, you can always uh, wipe off your tool on a Kleenex, come back, and it is it is kind of gummy as it sets, so you can scrape it up a little bit and kind of interrupt it. So you there know, we go. Kind of reminds me of. Huh. Kind of reminds me of the art style from uh, Series of Unfortunate Events. It's not uh, quite cell shading, but it's got this like contrasty yet bold, almost not comic book look, but it's it looks really good. It's I very like it stylized. Yeah, it's really stylized for sure. It's, I prefer that over the realistic water. I'm going to be honest. I, I love that. Yeah, I mean, I, I find, I, I don't know. Well, our miniatures are stylized too, right? So I'm just... Pretty much in my mind, I'm just trying to suit the art style at this point of the whole beast. Um, 
And yeah, this is, I just, I like this effect. I like how water looks done like this. So for me, um, I like it a lot more than trying to do like big realistic uh, stuff. I, I often find it doesn't look as realistic as it tries in the first place. So yeah, I agree with Valandar. If you put real water in there, I mean, it would be almost, it would almost change the piece. It would, right. Yeah, it would. It's important at this, I think. Yeah. So I'm pretty happy with it. Yeah. I'm glad you like it, Justin. I hope the rest of you think it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, Valandar, I do agree with you, too. Yeah, it does make the green-brown shadows pop in the water, too. Yeah, so... Yeah, exactly. Like, that's what I was saying yesterday, um, Image of Betrayal, is, like, is adding water to... If you have a very static piece, like the Spirit Beast here, who's just standing, one way to add a lot of motion is to add water to your basing, m moving water. It just implies motion just by being there. And then I chose to, you know, make it more splooshy, like he's kind of standing in a rock in the middle of a strong river, um, you know, and that's, I just like that. I like how it works with the piece. And I like how the blue works with the, it really makes his fur look more green. Um, so now I've got very analogous color scheme. I've got actually a green, blue, purple um, as my main color scheme, uh, which is, you know, next to each other on the color wheel and stuff. So, so yeah, so it's, uh, it's, it's working out. I'm liking this guy. I may have to actually put a lot of work into him and get him, uh, get him painted. He's, he's actually fun, and I really uh, like the piece. So, awesome. Well, do we have a raid? My dog has managed to hold off. Yes. Awesome. Who are we raiding today? I think in uh, in essence of, of the fact that Paizo has their con going all week, we might be raiding them most of the week. Oh, okay, yeah, um, Paizo. It brings awareness to their con, and... I imagine they'll do something similar when we have ours in September. It's, it's yeah, that'd be now, great. But we are partnered with them, and it just seems really appropriate. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So get ready for PaizoCon, guys. I hope that uh, we're keeping you entertained this week. Thanks for tuning in so much. I, as usual, I enjoy you. I hope you liked my water um, and maybe got some ideas for doing your own. Uh, and yeah, and maybe tomorrow we'll talk about putting things in the water on this side to suggest more scenicness. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. I've got other models lined up too, but I kind of am really enjoying this one. So have fun, everybody. Yep. Thank you guys very much. Keep being awesome. Indeedy. Um, spread the Reaper love. Tell the, our people over at Paizo we said hi. Oh, I have fun with you guys too, Twisted Oma. It's awesome. Have a great one. Have a great morning. See you guys tomorrow. Bye. Don't forget, we don't have a show this afternoon, and we will not have a show on Wednesday afternoons for the foreseeable future until we're, you know, ready. But uh, outside of that, uh, we'll see you guys tomorrow morning for more Anne, and then we'll have a loaded day with Sadie and uh, Reaper Live. So thank you guys very much, and uh, I'll see you guys tomorrow.